awesome. So that is that is um, screen shared. That's me, uh, Devternity, on stage in 2017. I thought I'd start. Yeah, I, I, I guess we should take another picture. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. If anybody wants to take a screenshot with you know with, with a composite image, then feel free to do that. Yeah. Um, so let's just see. Okay, right. so, so um, it's, how, it's, how it's already, it's like it's almost nine. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. moving the stage to you and yeah, feel free to drive the audience. So, so far we have like 165 people. So I guess they will be joining. Uh, so yeah, good luck. Excellent, thank you very much. Right, so um, folks, if you have any um, questions and things, I suddenly, suddenly cursed me, I ought to put Slack somewhere visible. Um, you know, feel free to put stuff into Slack. Um, but right so um good morning and uh, wherever or rather good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are and whenever you are um so uh i'm going to start here's a picture of me um 2017 on stage at dev eternity um a slightly inception event um and you can see successively smaller versions of me which kind of fits in with the theme of today's talk decremental development and Decremental development is a phrase, um, it's a term that I coined back in around 2005, um, 2005, 2006. Um, and it's a theme I keep revisiting um, uh, every year, uh, every year or two. In fact, a few years ago, I did a talk, um, Small is Beautiful, um, entitled Small is Beautiful, based on the, uh, the title of this um, kind of, uh, uh, this book uh, by Ernst Schumacher, who's an environmental economist. This is a Kind of classic of the environmental movement uh, from the 1970s and one of the examples um, that i used when trying to try to advocate this idea that we should favor less over more uh, was an example um, from 2016 uh, and as part of the security theater um, that became popular uh, in airports and particularly in america there was an idea that you should um, randomly split people up if they're queuing to go through uh, to um, security uh, at the airport you should randomly select whether they go to the uh, metal detector on the left or the metal detector on the right so you should randomly switch between them and what they decided was to create an application so you had human beings standing there with ipads um with, with ipads that had an arrow and the arrow went one way or the other. And it, you know, human being would stand there, TSA officer would stand there and press on the screen and it would randomly generate a left or a right arrow. I'm, honestly, this is, a, it's not just a waste of an iPad, it's a waste of a human being to do that. Um, so they actually paid for this. They paid $50,000 to have an application that randomly changes arrow on the screen, $50,000. I mean, that, I mean, that's, if you can get that kind of work, well done. It cost them another $300,000 or so to roll it out. But just think about that, $50,000. Somebody's paying $50,000 for this. This is absolutely amazing. Um, so there was this really nice little video um, uh, and it was done by um, uh, Chris Pasheer. Uh, and he recreated this in Android. The platform wouldn't make a difference in about 10 minutes. And I've got to say, when I watched the video, he was taking it easy. You know, he could have done it in five minutes if he was in a hurry but he was taking it easy, 10 minutes. So I thought I'd have a go. Now I'm not a web developer, but I thought, you know what? Let's build JavaScript. I can actually get a left arrow and a right arrow. Just, yeah, and I can, I, I can just randomly choose between them. I can actually put it on the screen. I can make it an event. I can put it in a script, do a little bit of prettying and for good measure, just make sure that it's fully um, uh, politically correct um, HTML. And the point here is that here we have something that is functionally equivalent to something that was far more expensive. I, I'd actually say you don't need an application for this anyway. I, it's a fairly pointless um, exercise. As I say, it's security theater. Um, in fact, it would have been better to have no code at all. And that is the point. Anderson's Law, named for Paul Anderson, science fiction author, tells us that one of the things that we can uh, consider is just this very simple idea that wherever we have any kind of problem, we can always make it harder, um, that there is always a possibility. Um, 
And this is almost a standard for software developers. I've yet to see any problem, however complicated, which when you looked at it in the right way did not become still more complicated. If somebody says, oh, look, this is, you know, you've given me a really simple problem, but I bet I can make it more interesting. I bet I can actually overcomplicate it by adding a tech stack that is actually not strictly speaking solving the problem. And we often talk about things, we overcomplicate things. Um, we, take an I we take ideas that are not necessarily bad and are suitable. So for example, um, microservices have become very popular over the last decade. In fact, um, it's 2011, the term microservice was actually coined, so it's a 10 year anniversary. But there are many people who are embracing microservices or other techniques at scale because you know Google are doing that, Amazon are doing it, but actually they're running small businesses and they don't need that kind of complexity. And they are making things harder for themselves. I know of a company that has not changed in the scale of its business, um, but about, I think three or four years ago, they took a PHP application that served their business well, that had been developed by two developers, and they redeveloped it into microservices using .NET with a team of about seven or eight. And it was functionally equivalent. And clearly it took longer to develop and, and so on. And we have a habit of making things complicated and intricate, but in all the complexity, things always get larger. Um, as um, Ernst Schumacher observed today, we suffer from an almost universal idolatry of giantism. It is therefore necessary to insist on the virtues of smallness where this applies. And maybe it doesn't apply everywhere, but I have never seen a large system that could not be a small system. And why does this stuff matter? Well, first of all, we need to remember your customers do not buy software uh, by the line, um, as the tester David Evans noted. But there are practical consequences for this. This is not just me being, saying, oh, you know, it's an aesthetic preference. I prefer this. I'm not expressing a preference that is merely um, aesthetic. I'm telling you one that is actually um, economic um, and practical. Um, so quoting Graham King from a blog post that he wrote in 2015, and I presume that Facebook still have the same problems, um, uh, the Facebook iOS app has over 18,000 Objective-C classes. I presume now they're all Swift classes. And in a single week, over 400 people contributing to it. Now, when I originally spoke about this, when I originally read the blog, for me, the, the takeaway message, the, the shocking thing was like, oh my goodness, 18,000 classes. I, what is it doing? I mean, this is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And that's true. And I do sometimes ask people, you know, things and they, uh, people always ask the wrong question. They, they, uh, uh, they often say, yeah, but what if it's some of it's generated? What if it is? It's still 18,000 classes. What is it that you are generating? Yeah, that doesn't matter whether it's uh, uh, written by people or by um, uh, uh, automatically generated. But there's a different thing here. And people sometimes assume, oh, it's analytics. No, that's that's the back end primarily. And really, it doesn't take 18,000 classes to spy on somebody. We're actually simpler than that. The real trick to this one is understanding how we make things large. Large, large is large and complex is because we have created an environment that can only create large and complex things. It's not to do with the problem. That application doesn't need 18,000 classes, but 400 people do. I want you to imagine trying to create a small application with over 400 people. You're going to find that you can't do it. Okay, that's the problem. We overstaff certain things. They become large because we imagine them to be large. Um, and we make them large by putting lots of people on it. You, if you've got a team of about 20, I bet you could redevelop something with equivalent functionality that was actually more efficient and actually pleasant to use. Um, and that would be much simpler to maintain. It would be, um, in other words, its defect list would be shorter. Um, its deployment issues would be shorter, uh, would be much less. And the ability to add new functionality would be increased. So the trick with every application, as Schumacher observes, is to find the appropriate scale. Now, scale is a word that we've really kind of fallen in love with recently. A little bit too much, I would say. Um, and there is this idea that we have intrinsically, we assume economies of scale, okay? The thing here is software development doesn't have economies of scale. So uh, what's economies of scale? I've got a pen here. I've got, these are Pilot G7s, 
uh, no, sorry, Pilot G2s. I, I think these are great pens. I've got a lot of them. I just ordered a new pack the other day and a whole load of these. By ordering many that are identical, I get an economy of scale. To buy one is going to be more expensive than to buy, say, 10 and divide the price by 10. Economies of scale, that's from the manufacturing world. In software development, we don't do manufacturing. Or rather, we do do manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing, that's, that's called a build system. In other words, that's a solved problem that's been automated. The real work that we do is to do with people and interaction. That is the challenge. And that does not have economies of scale beyond a particular point. Indeed, past a particular point, we get diseconomies of scale. And therefore, we create self-fulfilling prophecies. The reason a system becomes big is because we put lots of people on it and we choose practices that encourage bigness. We often focus on incremental development. In fact, these days we have, um, you know, when we talk about scale, there's been a, a kind of a fetish, a craze for um, scaled agile approaches, um, things like SAFE, which is um, the scaled agile framework, which is it's actually not scaled, it's not agile, and it's certainly not a framework, um, but it is management friendly. And we see the abuse of Scrum, which is actually a surprisingly simple idea, yet has been made complicated and been made uh, very regimented and has been used to justify um, certain uh, practices which are not conducive, do not actually cause us to create good software. So one of the aspects we want to focus on is incremental development, evolutionary design. But one of the other things that tempers it and balances it is the other way. We keep talking about incremental development. We don't talk enough about decremental development. So the value here, um, and I'm quoting the French from Blaise Pascal before I quote the English, because a number of people misquote this and have attributed it to various people from Abraham Lincoln to Groucho Marx. <coughs> it was Blaise Pascal um, in the 17th century. I have made this longer. He's referring to a letter. I have made this letter longer than usual because I have not had time to make it shorter. We are very poor at managing our time. And what are the benefits of understanding that we can reduce the scope and the scale of something? Uh, again, is this just a nice thing to have or are there other benefits? And this is the important thing. We manage our time poorly rather than trying to create good software that is easy to add functionality to. People become functionality or feature focused by ignoring the ability to add features by trying to add features against the software's will, if you like. And what are the consequences of this? Let us understand the virtue of smallness and less. Uh, this is old advice. This comes from um, uh, More Programming Pearls, um, uh, which was uh, written by John Bentley oh, uh, over 30 years ago. It's a collection of his Programming Pearls um, columns for communications of the ACM. And he wrote prog programming pearls and then more programming pearls. And in one section, he's got this really nice bumper sticker computer science. And bumper sticker computer science is all these wonderful quotes um, about software engineering um, and development as a whole. Nice quote from Gordon Bell, the cheapest, fastest, and most reliable components of a computer are those that aren't there. The fastest IO is no IO as Nils Peter Nelson observes. And that was actually echoed a few years later in the Talagent Guide to Design Programs in the mid nineties. Remember that there is no code faster than no code. This is the virtue. When you come to optimize stuff, the more stuff you have, the harder it is to optimize by definition. The less you have, the easier it is to optimize. But it's not just about optimization. This is also about maintenance. If, if somebody wants to create a software system that you can add features to easily, you need to have less of the software system the more of it, okay? You need to have everything plays a role. The more noise you have, the more it gets in the way of everything that you as a developer and clients as the receivers want. A client will never say, please make my software messy so that it costs me more to add more features. Please add code that is unnecessarily complex and code that is not necessary so that you can deliver things to me faster. If we actually said that to people, it is very unlikely they would think that was reasonable. They, there is an assumption that we that it's not our job to produce good software, that it's our job to just produce features without attention to detail or quality. This clearly doesn't make any sense when you look at it from an economic point of view. So customer dissatisfaction comes from ignoring 
these fundamental qualities of software. Um, these days, we can motivate a lot of things, um, a lot of things through um, security. Uh, security is a big concern for a lot of people. Uh, one of the things I found very interesting is by simply telling people, you know, why, why do we care about code quality? Why do we care about reducing the code that we have so that we can understand what we have? Well, if you don't understand what you have, if you don't know what you have, then how do you know how secure it is? Oh, we've got a whole pile of unmanaged technical debt. What does that code over there do? We don't know. What does it depend on? We're really not sure. Is your code secure? Oh, yes. Well, no, you can't say that. If you're not in control of your code, then how can you be in control of its qualities? It's a very simple observation. Testability. We value testability for a variety of reasons. So there's an interesting one here that um, I want to take you back to 1996, given that we we're in the mid 90s with the Talgen Guide. Uh, I want to take you back to 1996. And the um, there's uh, a... Uh, this is this is the Ariane 5 launcher. OK, this is uh, on the launch pad, European Space Agency, um, uh, French Guyana. And, it, you know, it's a it's a magnificent launcher. Um, it's one of the most uh, powerful and reliable launches, although actually, you know, there are more powerful launchers now. Uh, Ariane 6 is successor, for example. Um, but Ariane 5, this was its maiden launch. This was the first time it was due to be launched. So that's 25 years ago. OK, the first launch. And this is just um, this is just after launch, um, and uh, and this is a this is just about a minute after launch. As you can see, this turned into one of the world's most expensive fireworks. The overall cost in practice was about three hundred million euros. Um, uh, it scattered parts of the cluster mission. Um, it, sp it scattered parts of the cluster mission. Um, uh, all over the forest of French Guyana, and I really don't think that they needed that. Now, what is it that caused this to um, explode just under 40 seconds into flight? Well, uh, turns out there's a nice little uh, thing that I found on the internet a few years ago. I knew what the cause of the problem was. I, I read the ACER report in the mid nineties, not because I'm involved in the software, but because I have an interest in space travel and software. And the, I knew the basic reasons, but a few years ago, I found the actual code. It was in a talk that was given by somebody who had been involved. Um, and you don't have to know a lot of French to be able to understand it. The title of the talk was Un Petit Bug, Un Grand Boom. Um, and in the talk, they showed the code. Oh, this is fantastic. I thought this is absolutely brilliant. So, um, Actually, this so this so if you're not familiar with the code itself, you're not familiar with the language. This is Ada, um, and what's interesting is I am familiar with Ada, um, and this is not good Ada. I'm not a I'm not an Ada programmer, but it, this is not great Ada. Uh, this is uh, very very questionable. Um, this is what's sometimes called Ada Tran. Um, in other words, this is kind of, well, you know, the observation that you can write Fortran in any language. Um, this is really not making the best use of ADIS facilities. So actually, let's let's just we can let's highlight a few things. So first of all, we can kind of see, you know, we've got a hard coded literal. Fortunately, because you're a developer, you understand what this magic number is. You think, ah, oh, that's the maximum value of a signed 16 bit int. And then there's another number here. That's a number, that's a hexadecimal number, which when you look at it, you realize, wait a minute, that's the maximum value of a signed 16-bit int. Why do they write it once in decimal and once in hexadecimal? I mean, were they bored? Then we get the minimum value. And then we get the minimum value again in hexadecimal. And then we see it repeated. It says some glorious copy and pasting going on here. Um, you know, why use things like constants? In fact, why use things like the programming language? You can actually say what the you can ask what is the maximum value, just as uh, as you can in, in modern languages. You can basically say, for a sixteen bit int, I want its maximum value and its minimum value. Why why are we not doing that? And what's going on here is that we are uh, so at the moment we're not really talking about decrements. Uh, we're not talking about something that is reduced. Let's talk about the bit that is reduced. If you look closely, you will see that this looks surprisingly similar to this. This if logic is identical. If you look at it closely, you will realize what we have 
is what is written uh, in most languages as clamp. OK, that's what's going on. You are clamping. You are basically trying to take you're converting a value or rather you're taking a value and you're basically saying it needs to be in this range. Here's the maximum. Here's the minimum. OK, if the value is within that range, you just return the value. If the value is out is above that range. You return the maximum. If it's below that range, you return the minimum. So we are thresholding. We are clamping the value. This is our first point of reduction, the removal of duplication. Duplication is one of the greatest sources of unnecessary code. It's the first bit that we can decrement and reduce. Now, the other thing, what is it that we're clamping? We are clamping a, a conversion from a 64-bit um, from a 64-bit floating point number to a 16-bit signed number. Now, you might notice, actually, by the way, all the way through, there's this underscore 32, underscore 32, underscore 32, okay? We see the underscore 32, it comes in absolutely everywhere. Um, and you and I've had somebody ask me, well, Kevin, no, no, you said 64-bit. You're, you're incorrect, because here it says 32. This is why you don't hard code type information into names. It is a 64-bit real, 64-bit floating point number with underscore 32. They changed it, but they didn't change the name. So in other words, we already know the code is not good, but here we see duplication. But the question I will ask you is there is a conversion. There is a conversion here. Why is this clamping not applied to this piece of code and importantly to this piece of code? Why is the clamping not there? The reason is because this, this clamping is not necessary because the value can't, in these cases, exceed um, uh, the range. By definition, on Ariane 4, this is not physically possible. If you're listening carefully, you will realize I've just said Ariane 4, but we're talking about the Ariane 5 rocket. This is an example of reuse. What has happened is we have reused code from the Ariane 4 into the Ariane 5. We have not retested the scenario. And most importantly, the reason it wasn't retested is because this code is not necessary. It does not, it's not required for Ariane 5. This code is dead code. Or to be precise, it's not actually dead. It's what we would call zombie code. And this is a key point. Delete dead code. So not only can we decrement this, because of duplication. We can decrement this because it is dead code. And sadly, it came back to life with unintended consequences that ultimately led to the correct execution of the self-destruct system. So the software for the self-destruct system worked. So here's a point. Deleting dead code, do it. There's no reason not to. Sometimes people, oh, there's a technical reason. No, there is no technical reason. If you can't delete that code, it means you do not understand what your system is doing. You need to, you know, if a, if, you, if a manager says we can't do this, what they're admitting is we have lost control of the software. We have no idea how it is being used or who is using it. Static analysis and runtime monitoring. These are essential to a modern system. OK, and whenever people say, oh, but we might break a customer's piece of code. For an edge case, that's fine. You address that problem when you come to it, given that the very same companies that say that they can't do it for this reason are on a daily basis breaking their customers' code for far, far less important reasons, we need to prioritize. In other words, this is going to cause you problems. This causes problems that, and it's not unique to Ariane. We, we, see, this on, um, uh, we see this on a daily basis in other systems. We've seen it on the stock exchange. Knight Capital Group went out of business. Um, in 2012 because of duplicate, or oh, sorry, dead code that had not been removed. So here's, a, here's an interesting point. We are talking in many ways about unmanaged technical debt. And let's be very clear, a lot of people misunderstand technical debt. A lot of people think technical debt is intrinsically a bad thing. If that's what you're, th if that's what you're thinking and that's how you use it on your teams, um, I would suggest, I wrote a blog uh, last year for O'Reilly that clarifies, no, that's not what technical debt is. A lot of technical debt is bad, but technical debt is not automatically bad. It's the unmanaged technical debt you've got to watch out for. Are you managing your technical debt? If the answer is yes, well done. If the answer is no, which is the more likely option, then it means you've lost control of your system. You are not in charge of the system. The system is in charge of you. And what does that mean? It basically means we have too much stuff and we don't understand it. That's a very simple way of putting it. And what are the consequences of this? Um, it's difficult to retain staff. People don't like working on this kind of code. Um, we have security issues I, I've highlighted. It's harder to get compliance, to um, meet regulatory requirements. Um, it is 
Uh, you deal with more defects. If you like dealing with defects, that's absolutely fantastic. It makes development harder. It makes the addition of new features harder. Uh, it means that your ability to track markets, to track requirements, to track technology changes, all of these things become harder. This is a question of architecture. Now, um, so uh, there's a couple of things. Um, the uh, I've just spotted a couple of questions popping up. So let's just take a pause for this. How much is solid contradicting the sacramental development? If you're still following solid and it's 2021, you need to get with the program. Solid is not really a very useful set of principles um, for developing good software. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit cherry picked. It's a little bit misunderstood. Um, it's or rather it's based on misunderstandings. Um, one of the most toxic examples in solid is the open close principle, um, which is based on a misunderstanding of what the original open close principle was. And the open close principle basically prevents uh, is a discouraging people from writing um, small code that is refactorable. And the others are just just go back to the old techniques, talk about focus on cohesion and coupling and conformance. Liskoff is actually one of the ones that I uh, value most strongly there. Um, so yeah, uh, solid, if you're still following that, that's not really where you want to focus your attention. You want to focus on good software rather than solid software. Um, so um, if less is sometimes better, then why is our solution to so many problems still let's just add more code and abstractions? That's a very good question. Um, we don't do things because they are good or right. We do things because they are convenient, but more importantly, they are short term convenient. As human beings, it's actually kind of pretty much in our wiring. Uh, it's related to something known as the hyperbolic discounting effect. Uh, we value short term gains that are easily uh, easily identifiable over long term gains that feel more abstract. Um, and we so therefore, this is one of those key ideas um, that is in kind of based on evolutionary psychology, behavioral economics, and a number of other things. But there is also another idea is that we tend to conceive, we tend to think about software as an additive approach. We think software development is about adding things. And that's also one of the reasons, by the way, that our estimates are often so, you know, it's one of the reasons, there are many reasons, why estimates are often so far off track. Because people imagine adding stuff. The, um, the uh, when you imagine adding things, it's always a lot easier than changing things that are already there. Yeah. Software development is not about adding stuff. So, or rather, software development, if it is about adding stuff, um, it is about adding stuff after you have removed them. We need to talk much more about refactoring driven development, which is a different discipline. We'll get to that in a moment. So, um, how do we avoid duplication of code in a software engineer, uh, engineering team with multiple teams? Um, so there's some really good examples within that thread. Um, uh, look for code duplication, but at the same time, let's be very clear. Um, be very clear about some of the boundaries we want to set. I am not in favor of eliminating code duplication. I am in favor of reducing code duplication. There is a huge difference between these two. Um, and there, it's a very subtle difference. When you are dealing with multiple teams, sometimes that duplication is unnecessary. Um, and you need additional you need uh, additional things and the points are made in the thread on slack very very clearly um, you can use tooling um, you can use pairing and mobbing in other words actually team cooperation um, you can use cross reviewing there's lots of different techniques these help reduce but sometimes the duplication is helpful because there is a trade off um, when you understand the principles of coupling and cohesion so you know i talked about solid uh, focus on coupling and cohesion. Okay, if you if you're trying to do solid and you don't understand coupling and cohesion, you, you're really not going to do a very good job at all. Which is one of the reasons people make such a mess with solid. Coupling and cohesion are the foundational principles. The next one you need to watch out for is um, how they relate to other qualities like duplication. And sometimes a little bit of duplication allows us to loosen the coupling. So duplication is not intrinsically bad. Do not use it as an unconditional principle. Use it as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a question. If you find that you are duplicating the same code and it's genuinely copy and paste code around the same code base, that is a problem. But if you find there's a soft amount of duplication, in other words, similar logic and so on uh, across multiple systems by multiple teams, and you know it's no more than about, say, 5% duplication, that's quite tolerable. And I'm using 5% because that's actually a, a figure that um, I, I dealt with in a couple of teams uh, a few years ago and they were trying to eliminate that duplication and that was causing them problems they the two teams became too strongly coupled 
Um, it was about the right level. In other words, there needs to be a little bit of lubrication for uh, uh, the team to do couple. So decrement is not eliminate. That's a very important point. You're looking for the happy, uh, optimal uh, range there. Um, so a couple of other comments and then we'll kind of continue. Um, so uh, question from Kevin Colson, do I think that education system is on a par with that state of mind? There is an important point here um, about um, how we educate people and our values and reinforce those, but also to show people the possibilities. Because sometimes people are just told, oh, you should, um, you know, deleting dead code, you should do that. Or reducing the amount of duplication, you should do that. It's great to be told these things, but until you show people what that looks like, it's very difficult. Education is not just about telling people principles, it's about embodying those principles in practice and showing people what the good, the bad, and the ugly actually look like and getting them involved in that. Um, so, um, so, uh, so let's see, anything, anything else? I kind of, um, oh, question from Joel um, Ruelas. Uh, what is the best time to reduce the code um, continuously? We're going to talk about that. Um, so let's talk about this because we're talking about architecture. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about code, but I'm talking about the overall architectural consequences, which are cost related. So how do we go about doing this? Um, architecture is inhabited sculpture. It's a lovely way of thinking about it. It's, it's inhabited. In other words, we are living inside it. As developers, we live within the space created by our software. And as we're talking about sculpture, there's this lovely quote from George Pentecost um, in The Angel in the Marble. This one is variously misquoted around the internet. Michelangelo has been uh, credited with it, but it's actually more recent. There is a beautiful angel in that block of marble, and I am going to find it. All I have to do is knock off the outside pieces of the marble and be very careful not to cut into the angel with my chisel. We are looking to reduce and find the form. This is the essence of refactory. And this is great commit strip, um, uh, uh, a cartoon from uh, the summer this year. Uh, manager talking to the developer. So will refactoring code improve the loading time? Yeah, not really. Uh, will it improve security then? No. So it's for browser compatibility? Absolutely not. So tell me, why is it always the same old story with you guys wanting to refactor everything? I need to know. Because as devs, if we know we've left messy code, we can't stop thinking about it. When we make, wake up in the morning, at lunchtime, in the evening, when we go home and when we're trying to go to sleep, it haunts us. It haunts us. So refactoring, this is how we do it. This is the idea of doing this continuously. When do we reduce the code? When we are creating it, after we have created it, even before we have created it by trying to understand the very problem that we're, we're looking at, by asking the right questions, by having conversations with our colleagues. Now, refactoring was popularized Initially, um, I, it really initially came to my attention um, in the, ri the, the rising awareness in the mid 90s um, that led to extreme programming and uh, all came out of extreme programming. I, refactoring, I'm pretty sure I hadn't heard the word before I'd heard about extreme programming. And then uh, Martin Fowler's book in 1999 really kind of set the scene for making this a first class concept, the idea of improving the design of existing code. The subtitle tells us everything that we need to know. Um, so um, there's a question here, there's a point here from Pedro uh, Quinta. Sometimes reducing code can cost more than time than adding, at least it's what managers say. Sure, if they say that, ask them for the evidence. Um, I mean, I don't wanna get into this confrontational situation, but if I have a non-technical person who is trying to tell me how to do a technical role, then I, I would question their authority and their experience on this matter. It's not their job to do that. It's their job to allow the team to do its work, not to prevent the team from doing its work. And if they are gonna make an economic case, they better make a really good one because the economics are not on their side. A change made to the internal structure of software to make it easy to understand and cheaper to modify. Oh, there's an economic case here. I see, without changing its observable behavior. And it turns out that this definition is consistent um, in the second edition uh, of refactoring, which came out just a couple of years ago. Now, refactoring, it does actually go back further. Um, uh, Bill Opdyke uh, started looking into automated refactorings in the late 80s and early 90s. And this is his PhD thesis, um, Refactoring Object-Oriented Frameworks, as you can see, 1992. 
his advisor, Ralph Johnson, one of the Gang of Four. Um, a lot of the original work on refactorings was done at, a, um, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And Bill makes this observation, this point, refactorings are defined to be behavior preserving. Now, to understand what we mean by um, uh, uh, behavior preserving, uh, let me just answer quickly, um, uh, 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 Daniel's uh, uh, uh question: What are the prerequisites to start decremental programming? Programming. You can't de you can't reduce something. You can't decrement unless you have a thing. That's it. You, you you once you have a thing, look at it. Do I need? Is there something better that is smaller? If the answer to that is yes, there you go. That's 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 it. You know. If the answer is no, keep go keep going. If the answer is I'm not sure, keep going. You know, it's not going to happen now. It's going to happen continuously. That is the key. Like incremental development, decremental development is a continuous. It's what we might want to call continuous development, given that we're putting the word continuous in front of everything these days. So let's talk about behavior preserving. Let me give you a simple right hand rule for understanding kind of the properties and qualities that you have in your code. The code has functional qualities. These are semantic qualities. Often when people talk about behavior preserving they're talking about this they don't actually mean behavior preserving because there's another side of behavior operational operational is how something runs it's it's its performance characteristics the functional characteristics are the semantics that's the events the values it's the stuff that you test in unit tests the operational characteristics that's memory usage that's uh, you know that's throughput that's round trip times that's the running side of how does it do it that's behavior as well yeah, there's a kind of a computer science uh, blindness to saying, oh, that's not behavior. No, really, it is behavior. When you look at what behavior means in the dictionary, behavior includes all that messy stuff. So it's not just so behavior covers both the semantics and the operational side. And then there's developmental qualities of your code, the habitability, the maintainability, the portability, the development time. If we're going to inhabit the sculpture, this is what we experience. What's it like to be a developer in that? Developmental qualities are what is the cost of maintenance? What is the frequency um, of um, uh, defects? And the, or, you know, can you find a heat map for the defects in your code base? That's the developmental side. Now, when you fix a bug, you're improving the functionality. Okay. Um, when you fix a bug, Maybe the performance gets better, maybe it gets worse, maybe it stays the same, maybe the developmental quality gets better, worse, stays the same. Those are not really of uh, primary interest when fixing a bug. When you optimize something, however, that is a, that is a semantics preserving operation, okay? What is sometimes called behavior preserving, but it's actually semantics preserving. You are going to preserve the outputs, the inputs, the events, all of those things. Uh, the, the markable behavior that is not to do with time and space. In other words, uh, memory and time-based behavior. Um, but that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to improve the time or space-based behavior. That's your goal, but you're gonna leave the semantics unchanged. What happens when you optimize? What happens to the developmental quality? Eh, maybe it gets a bit better, maybe it gets a bit worse, maybe it gets it stays the same. You know, in other words, often we think that it, people often assume it gets worse because you're adding more special cases to make something faster, but that's not always necessarily the case. As I said, remember there is no code faster than no code. Sometimes the optimization is to remove stuff and that also improves um, the code quality. And then there's refactoring. What does refactoring look like? Well, that's semantics preserving as well. But the goal here is to improve the developmental experience, to make it easier to change, to make it more pleasant to change, to make it more pleasant to inhabit. And perhaps the behavior uh, on the operational side, the performance characteristics, perhaps they stay the same, perhaps they get better, perhaps they get worse. You know, the, the point there is that the goal of refactoring, the goal of each one of these changes is along a different axis. So how do we do this? Um, so um, uh, there's a question from uh, Carl Snipers, um, which is the best time to refactor the code? For example, you're doing a task and find out you need to refactor the code. You do it along with the task or make it as a separate one to finish the task later. My instinct on this one, um, my instinct on this one is that you do it, uh, I've just shown you this kind of like simple right-hand rule. This is actually quite a useful rule for kind of letting you focus your mind on how you do changes. Instead of having, don't end up doing what a guy I used to work with many years ago, suitably and anonymously called John Smith, all his check-in messages were the same. He did large batch check-ins and they were always, 
uh, change some code, fix some bugs, added some features. That's it. There's nothing helpful there. You want to break down each of your check-ins so that they are transactional and they are focused. And if you can focus them and say, this is a focus on this axis, this is a focus on this axis. If you are taking code that already exists, if you are taking code that doesn't exist, i.e. it's just in your IDE, you've just been working on it, decrement now. If you can see something simpler, then do it now. You don't need to check in the version that, you know, your first thought. Do it continuously. The, the question is when the question to when do we decrement is the same as the uh, uh, the answer to the question when do we refactor and and that is very much the process that we're going to have um, how do we refactor the verb what is the re, the verb um, uh, uh, verb activity and and so a question from uh, Joel is decremental programming relatable to continuous refactoring in TDD yes it is but it has a very specific intent it is a particular subset of the refactorings so decremental development happens at all time scales. It happens in the minutes, it happens in the hours, it happens in the days, the weeks, the months, and the years. Okay, in other words, it's at all levels of scale. It's the same as with incremental development, except when people talk about incremental development and TDD. So I'm glad you brought that question up, Joel. People normally think about, oh yeah, continuous refactoring and TDD, that's incremental development. Sometimes people prefer to call it evolutionary development because it's not always about adding stuff. Sometimes it's about removing stuff. We forget this. We are we have obsessed with adding stuff. Um, to restructure software by applying a series of refactorings without changing themselves or behavior of the software. Excellent. So, um, so let's understand a couple of things here. Um, so, Bill Opdyke uh, fo is specifically focusing on automated refactorings. One of the things I think that's been one of the greatest disappointments if you've been in software development for a while is the fact that everybody now has refactoring tools. Now, why is that a disappointment? It's not that they have refactoring tools, it's that they don't use them. That's what, uh, for me, is the greatest disappointment. 20 years ago, it's just like, oh, refactoring, that's gonna get rid of all of those messy, long methods. It's gonna, large classes are gonna be a thing of the past. Badly named variables are gonna be a thing of the past. Messy logic's a thing of the past. No, it isn't. It turns out that having the tool for most people makes no difference at all. They don't really understand what their vision is. And this is one of the reasons I focus on the decremental side is um, to understand that uh, to understand that you have a specific goal here. Try and keep this stuff focused. Your goal is to keep your uh, code focused. Two years ago at DevTurnity, I gave a keynote on lean code. The message was along similar lines. And a point here, um, uh, Turo asked the question, why introduce some code and then decrement it? Um, well, because you didn't know that there was a small solution. That's why it is. You don't, you're not adding something in order to remove it. You're adding something because you don't know better at this point. Software development is a continuous learning process. You don't necessarily, the minute you write the code, you don't know that that's the best solution. And if you think it is, come back in a week's time and you'll go, oh, why did I write that? I should have written this. Well, that's because you don't have a time machine, except that you do have a time machine. It's called a version control system. And you have the ability to manipulate time. That's why you need decremental development, because it is not obvious what you need in advance. But also over the larger time horizons, when somebody wants a feature, if that feature is no longer necessary in six months time, but it was necessary for six months, that's why you decrement it in six months time. So yeah, don't get the idea that people are adding code that you later decrement because they are doing a bad job. I think that's a very, that's a very negative thing. And it gets tied up this whole idea of being professional and stuff like that. People are not necessarily doing a bad job. They are probably doing the best job that they can do in the circumstances. But what we're inviting people to do is say, we can do a better job because we have the advantage that person didn't. And that person may have been you in the past. That person did not have the advantage of what I know now. That is the key. That's the difference. We have that opportunity. So yeah, uh, by the way, when I posted, uh, I posted this, I got, I got some really interesting tweets, people kind of thinking, you know, Kevin doesn't understand what's going on. It was meant as a joke, you know. So let's understand the ongoing process of refactoring. Isabella Beaton, uh, she's a figure from Victorian England, and um, she made she wrote a book on household management. And in it, she happens to have had this vision of the future of software. But cleverly, she disguised it as kitchen management. There is no work like early work. People are asking, when do I do this? Well, now. Clear as you go, muddle makes more muddle. As you are developing things, 
look for opportunities, understand it. This is the same message as continuous refactoring, except I've just told you, people don't know how to refactor. There's a lack of skill there. There are very few refactoring courses. I run one of the, uh, you know, when I look around and I look at people who runs refactoring courses, I'm one of the few people that does it. And because people often think, oh, I know how to refactor because I've got a context menu. There is a particular skill. You have to understand what it is that you want. And decrementing is one aspect. How do I reduce what is already here? How do I use my knowledge over time? How do I take advantage of time to improve the code? And it's normally about reduction, not to wash plates and dishes soon after using makes more work. Now, the point here is we keep using um, the... Um, uh, so there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting... Um, uh, Shamox asks, how do you sell it to the business that a, new, uh, that a new feature requires more time because of maintenance and bigger refactoring? I think you've just sold it to the business. First of all, you don't have to sell it to the business. It's called your job. Um, you know, do you go to do you consult the business? I'm going. I'm thinking of doing a new class here, and I wanted your input on. Do you do that? I don't think you do. So why are you going to ask them about? You know, here's a technical thing you don't understand. I'd like your opinion on it. Versus uh, here's another technical thing you don't understand. Why? No, it's called your work. That is your responsibility. And this is one of the reasons I advocate. Agile development, not agile development. Agile development is about team and developer autonomy, allowing people to use their expertise and to grow into that expertise. If you're in an environment that doesn't allow that, then whatever else they're saying, it's not, it's not, a, it's not an agile environment. But the other thing is, that's how you justify it. You say, do you want to have, do you want your features to take longer and be harder to maintain? Um, uh, and do you want to end up with big refactorings every now and then? And if they say no, then that's your case. You've just made the case for continuous refactoring with an emphasis on decremental development. Yeah, don't, don't apologize for doing a good job. Don't ask permission. What we're talking about here at one level is Kaizen. This is a lean practice. It's, uh, it's the Japanese um, for improvement, but has come to mean in the context of business, continuous improvement. Now with ordinary refactoring, let's just take a very simple problem here. Um, you know, I've got uh, this Java code. I've got, I've got a list of words. So it's a list of string. And what I want to do is um, uh, end up with a list that is in order of unique words. Okay, unique words and is in ascending order. And how do I do this? Well, I'm going to take a copy of it. Then I'm going to sort it into ascending order. But that doesn't eliminate the duplicates. Java does not have an algorithm. Um, uh, classic Java does not have an algorithm for eliminating duplicates. So then you have to drop down a level and you end up with this kind of like loop mechanics and you have to write it yourself. You might say, but this isn't like my, this isn't like my work. No, this is exactly like your work. I see so much code where people go, yeah, library, library. And then suddenly, oh, this isn't available in my standard library. And then suddenly there's a whole bunch of control flow sitting there. This is the bit you need to extract. Now, I have not done any decrementing here. I've just done movement. I've not done reduction. I have done movement. I've moved this into a, a helper method, remove adjacent duplicates. So I've tidied the code, but I've not done a reduction. The reduction opportunity comes when you look at it and you go, well, wait a minute, I'm familiar with Java 8, Java streams. I don't have to write, I don't have to refactor, I don't have to extract anything. I just need to look at the problem differently. And then I can just rearrange it. And suddenly in Java streams, it's just like, well, there you go. This is equivalent to that previous code. It's easy to understand, it's easy to explain, you can look through it. In fact, I can explain this to a non-programmer um, much more easily than I can explain this to a non-programmer. I can walk through this line by line. This has a value of being more declarative. On the other hand, you could just use the right data structure. Again, these are insights that don't immediately come to you, okay? Sometimes just finding the right abstraction is the challenge, and we're not gonna find the right abstraction in most cases the first time we touch it. Edsger Dijkstra made this observation, the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. Um, so I'm gonna pick on an example uh, that um, uh, included in my 97 Things Every Programmer uh, Should Know book, and this example is from Burke Hafnagel. And what I love about his piece, put the mouse down and step away from the keyboard, is there's two two aspects here. One is the title and his advice. If you're stuck with a problem and you've been working for hours focused on that problem, 
the chances are you're stuck and you're stuck in the same kind of thinking. You need to take a step back. You need a different kind of thinking. You need to take a break. You're going to save time by not working. That's one of those kind of standard things that eventually you learn. You can either spend eight hours trying to solve the problem or you can take a break and just do something else. The chances are you will, the second option will be more effective. But it's specifically the example he focused on that I like. This is the example he was dealing with. And clearly there's some kind of parsing problem. There's a string problem. We're dealing with some kind of parsing of a 12 hour time string. The operative thing to notice is the dot, dot, dot here. There's a lot more code. This is messy standard enterprise code. This is also what he refactored too. I dread to think what the code looked like before he refactored it. So initially he took something that was big and messy. This is the first cut at simplification. He reduced it in place. In other words, that's, just, that's how most people think of refactoring, reduce in place, Kaizen, all the rest of it, just extract, rename and move around, that's it. But the real insight comes when you step away from the problem and you realize you're looking at the problem the wrong way, you're using the wrong abstractions. The regular expression is far more simple. I'm not saying always, you know, regular expressions are always the solution, but this is again, a declarative approach. The declarative approach, I can explain this much more easily to somebody who is not a programmer and is not familiar with um, uh, regular expressions than I can explain this to somebody who already knows Java. I can read this from left to right. What I'm looking to match is a string that is, uh, that is basically a zero followed by one to nine or one followed by zero to two, then followed by a colon. In other words, I can read this from left to right. This is a declarative approach. It is a massive reduction. The maintenance on this is trivial. Why would we want to do decremental development? Because it saves us and our colleagues and our organizations and our business time. If you don't want to save yourselves time, money, effort, and pain, then ignore everything I'm saying, okay? This, in other words, the bit that people are missing from refactoring practice and incremental development is, or evolutionary uh, development, is Kaikaku, which is a counterpart. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a, an aspect um, that goes with Kaizen. Kaizen is continuous improvement. Kaikaku is radical change. Every now and then you need a radical change. You need a change of representation and insight comes to you. You go, ah, oh, there's a different way of looking at this. So we can see that it, this occurs in a lot of different pieces of code. Um, we can see the, um, I'm gonna pick a, I'll pick a couple of examples, then I'll wrap up and if we have any time, you know, I, I realize I'm at the end of time um, here. Um, I'll pick a simple example and just run through part of it. Um, one of the things I want to look at, biquinary coded decimal. What, what is biquinary coded decimal? It's a system of representing numbers based on counting in fives with an additional indicator to show whether the count is in the first or second half of the decimal range. There you go, first, second half of the decimal range. This is why we count in fives, okay? Um, we find it in many abacus systems, like classic abacus systems. You know, you have five and then an upper and a lower indicator, so the two beads at the top. It was actually used on a number of early computers before they realized, you know what, binary is a lot easier than faking decimal. Um, but, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this is Colossus, so we can actually see this was actually a, a you know, biquinary coded decimal was originally a representation that was used. But most commonly, we see it in Roman numerals. Um, and, you know, we can find it on sundials. We can also find it as a coding carter. And how do I convert a number, an integer, into a Roman numeral? And, well, hmm, I'm going to need more space. This is, the, this is the enterprise way of solving the problem. We have a lot of special cases. If, why, well, if, 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 if. Now, I think this is a terrible solution. It's, it's one that you, you know, I don't think it's a great solution. I mean, it does the job, so you might say that's great, ship it. It's what happens, you can see this emerging. I don't think it's elegant. I don't think it's simple. Um, it's, not, it's not declarative. It's not easy to maintain or easy to comprehend. It's messy, it's unnecessary. It's also, funnily enough, actually, as I discovered recently, a couple of years back, going through the old Pascal book. Um, and people always used to talk about Pascal as a great language. Honestly, Pascal's not a great language. Everybody who's ever told me they like Pascal didn't like Pascal, they liked an extended version of it. That's, in other words, Core Pascal is a pain in the backside, um, but it was always supposed to be about teaching good practice. Yet here in the book, on that right-hand page is exactly the structure I've just shown you. Uh, this, this, the, the, the use of Roman numeral conversions is not 
a modern idea. It goes back to the 1970s as a kind of uh, toy problem. So let's go back to this. When people refactor this, how do they do it? Well, first of all, we want to refactor the program in small steps. Why? You make a mistake, it's easy to find the bug. Okay, let's find the bug. So the first thing you need to do is have some a set of tests. And I can do this, in, I'm doing this in Python. I don't even need a test. I don't even need a, a, a testing framework. I can just do this quite trivially. Really simple, just basic confidence tests, um, uh, framework free, and this will give me enough of a safety net to make my changes. So I go back to this code. Now, what do most people see? They, they look for the duplication. Okay, that's people's instinct. Oh, what they do is they notice that there are these groupings, that these are very, very similar, and that one's left over. In other words, what they see is there's a pattern here. They see there's a while and then a factor of 10, and there's a while and then there's an, there's an if, sorry, and then a nine something, then an if, and then a five something, and then an if, and then a four something, and they refactor at this level. They're not thinking deeply enough that to really understand duplication, to decrement this, you need to look at this more carefully. You need to recognize that every single if here is a limited while. This has exactly the same functionality. In other words, the duplication is more fundamental. And how do we extract this? We realize that all that is varying is the value and the letters that we associate with the value. In other words, let's create a table. This is the whole point. We create a table. Again, another solution where we've done a declarative approach. You might be getting a message here. Most decremental development is about moving away from strongly imperative code. And this is not a case of like suddenly embrace functional program. This is not a functional programming technique. I mean, it can be used as functional programming. I first learned this technique very much in the context of procedural programming. It's a technique that transcends. It's a paradigm that cuts across all paradigms. It is more declarative. You can take imperative procedural code and make it more declarative by lifting the data structure um, that you find in common. As Frederick Brooks observes in The Mythical Man Month, he says representation is the essence of programming. Sometimes the strategic breakthrough will be a new algorithm. Much more often, the strategic breakthrough will come from redoing the representation of the data or tables. This is where the heart of the program lies. And that's the key idea here. It's this idea that what we are looking at is Sometimes a shift, a transition, a kaikaku, a sudden change going like, oh, wait a minute, all I've been doing is messing around, removing little bits of duplication, but there's a, a unifying idea behind this that I can reduce further. So last example, and then I'll wrap up and we might have a couple of minutes for questions, but um, I, I understand if the organizers would like to move on. Um, so this is the Gilded Rose. It's in World of Warcraft. It's, a, it's an inn in World of Warcraft. Um, and it's also become the basis for a refactoring uh, Carter, the Gilded Rose Carter, that's been around since 2015, 2014. Um, I was introduced to it a number of different occasions, but primarily by Emily Batch. And I've recently also started incorporating it into some of the workshops um, that I do. Um, so I've got a, a C-sharp uh, example here. I'm not gonna go through what the example is. I'm just gonna say, what is interesting about it, it's, a, it's control flow based. It's classic imperative control flow. Uh, messy technical debt, co duplicate logic, lots of changing state and all the rest of it. And it, what I like about this is it looks like legacy code. It looks like the kind of logic mess that you're going to end up with. And it's a bit of a tangle. You have to basically write tests to, to get yourself in a position. So this is the code as it starts. I've seen a lot of people do refactorings online. I, I have to admit, I don't like many of the refactorings that people do. Often they try and make this into an object-oriented problem. It's not an object-oriented problem. Um, it's a data transformation problem. And so therefore they end up with solutions that are far larger and more complex in some ways than the, what they started with, which is just a control flow problem. If you just treat it as a control flow problem and you just seek to remove duplication and reduce state change and rearrange the code, around those ideas, you end up with something that is much smaller. In other words, this has the same functionality, but now variable, uh, we, we, minimize, uh, we minimize state change, the transformations and the zoning in the code is much simpler. If you then take the next step and say, ah, I now see that there, this, so in other words, this is, this is Kaizen. This is gradual transformation of what was already there. The real trick is to understand that if you do a data-driven approach, it becomes a, a lot simpler. In other words, we end up with uh, code that has a declarative part, uh, a data part, and then a driver part, data driven. Okay, the data part, then the driven part. And that is one of the kind of key ideas here. 
but what we are looking for is as Susan Sontag observed, our task is not to find the maximum amount of content in the work of art. Our task is to cut back content so we can see the thing at all. That is the key idea. But what you're doing is every piece of code, it comes as a first draft. That may be the best that you can do at that point. That may be the best that somebody else can do. It may not be the best that somebody else can do, but what was left because of other constraints in their environment. The code is the way it is because of the way things were but that doesn't mean that they always have to be that way. We can bring new understanding. That is the benefit of time. We should use time to our advantage, okay? Um, people often don't regard time as a tool. They regard it as an obstacle. I'm regarding it as, a, as an advantage because that is where our knowledge comes from. The knowledge that we need is in the future. We're not gonna have everything we need to know now. The idea that we are doing continuous learning is essential to software development. When we say things like refactoring continuously, that's, that's a very broad brushstroke. We need to be more specific. How do I keep this code focused? I keep this code focused by taking away the things that are not necessary, remove the dead code, remove the duplication to the point, to an appropriate point, find out if the duplication starts increasing the coupling, then you've gone too far. Okay, you're look, constantly looking for a kind of a balancing act, okay? But there is also the idea that sometimes when you have reduced something to a particular point or lived with it for long enough, you suddenly look at it and go, I'm looking at this problem the wrong way. We have collectively been looking at this. I've had that with small examples, as we see. And always remember, large systems are made up of small bits of code and lots of them. But I've also seen it architecturally, where an architectural solution has been insanely complex and something far simpler. And this was one team many, many years ago. They ended up with a 200% performance improvement. They, when, I, when we said, you need to refactor this, oh, we don't have time for refactoring, we just want to improve the performance. I said, if you refactor, you will get a performance improvement. Just simply by tidying up the noise and the mess, they could see what was going on. Just by that act, they, improve, they improved 200%, a particular performance metric that they had struggled to improve uh, by 25% in the preceding two years, just by seeing what was going on removing certain classes of duplication, bringing the control, uh, bringing the code back under their own control. Decremental development is about keeping things trimmed and at the point of understanding. So thank you very much. Um, so effectively I'm done. I recognize that I have gone slightly over um, uh, in a couple of minutes and I have not answered uh, all of the questions I'm afraid. Yeah, I think actually you answered most of the questions. So. Uh, and uh, the, there are many of them in Slack, and I marked with your, your emoji. I marked all the questions. Yes, thank so you very much. Yeah. Go, go go through that after after the talk. And yes, so we have to I'm going to make a break now. <laughs> yeah. So you guys have a good break. I'm going to get myself a fresh coffee. If you have any more questions, I'll go back over the questions in Slack. If uh, if I feel that I already answered them, I you know I um, I, 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 I tried to mark them. them. The, the ones that you answer, I tried to mark them with, with, with the check mark, but maybe Excellent. something is not is missed. But yeah, but thank you very yeah. much for the talk. As, okay. as, as always, Cheers. amazing. And yeah, thanks. Thank you very thanks. much. Thanks very much.